Now, in the previous episode, we talked about something called an error syndrome. And that error syndrome, remember, was the exclusive OR of each of the stored parity bits of a Hamming code, along with the calculated uh, parity bits, newly calculated parity bits, from the data that we retrieved along with the stored parity bits. Now, those parity bits, if nothing happened, the parity bits that are stored should match up exactly with the parity bits that were calculated from the retrieved data. But whenever we have a difference, that difference identifies which of the bits had changed. And we talked a little bit about how the parity bits themselves can change. And if one parity bit flips, exactly one one will appear in the syndrome word, right? In that error syndrome. If more than one bit changed in the parity, that indicated that one of the data bits changed, and we need to identify which members or which groups, which parity groups, that bit, that data bit was a member of. So using that information, what we're gonna do is generate our own Hamming code for eight data bits. Now, I'm just trust me up front, four parity bits are gonna work for eight data bits. I'll show you in a minute, show you toward the ends of this uh, video exactly how we calculate that out. But let's go ahead and make a truth table. And now I have four syndrome bits because I have four parity bits. The number of syndrome bits I've got is exactly the same as the number of parity bits I've got. So I'll have S3, S2, S1, and S0 corresponding to the parity bits P0, P1, P2, P3. All right. So I've got four bits. That means I have 16 possible patterns of ones and zeros. Now, the first step was, what is the error, right? Because the, the pattern of ones and zeros here represents whatever happened as a result of this operation. All right, so this column right here is going to identify what error condition this pattern of ones and zeros in the syndrome it represents, okay? Now remember, the all zeros, that meant that P0, stored matched P0 calculated after retrieving the data. And the same is true for P0 and P1 and P2 and P3. All of the syndrome bits equal to zero means all the parity bits matched and there was no error. Now, there are other conditions which we should be able to easily identify or quickly identify. Whenever there's exactly one one in the syndrome, that means it was a parity bit that flipped. For example, if the one one is in S0, that means that the parity bit P0 is the one that is an error. If S1 is the position that is the only position that has a one in it, then we know that P1 is the bit that flipped. If we come down to where S1, S2 is the only bit that is a one, we know that P2 flipped. And if we come a little further down and see where S3 is the only bit that is a one, we know that that is the condition that represents P3 being flipped. Now, the rest of these bit positions, well, they identify the errors that we could have. In fact, how many do we have? Every single one of these blank rows is a, is a, is a row where more than one bit is a one in the syndrome, all right? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That means that with four parity bits, and having four parity bits, we have four syndrome bits. With four parity bits, I have the potential to detect errors in up to 11 data bits. All right? Let's just stick with eight. Let's do D, let's just go ahead and take the blank rows and assign them. D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7. All right? So and we're going to have three blank because remember we can store up to we can detect up to eleven data bits, but we're only going to do eight. So I'm going to leave those last three unused. What this shows me is exactly what expressions I'm going to be using in order to generate the parity bits. 
All right. <clears throat> now, the way this works is that P0, the P0 parity bit, is going to be the exclusive OR of all the data bits that are a member of its group. How do we know which ones are a member of its group? Well, it's all the, one, all the data bits that the syndrome word has a one in the S0 position. So, D1, so, so when we come down here, we see that P0 is going to be affected by D0. So we exclusive or that with D1, exclusive ORed with D3, exclusive ORed with D4, pretty much all, all a lot of them, isn't it? And exclusive ORed with D6, if I've got room here. All right. So another way of explaining that is that if any one of these bits, and just one of them, because remember, if we have two bits flipping, parity suddenly loses its power. Okay. So if any one of those bits change, then whenever we do this exclusive OR, P0 is going to be a different value than it was before being stored. Okay, so the stored value and the calculated value of P0 are going to change. That will mean that when we do the exclusive OR of the stored P0 with the calculated P0, then we're going to put a 1 in this bit position. All right. Now, where there are 1s in the other bit positions of the syndrome, that will identify which one of these it was that flipped. So let's figure out what P1 is. Well, P1 corresponds to this column, the column for syndrome bit 1, right? And so that means that P1 depends on D0. Then we come down here, we see also D2 and D3. And then we come down a little further, we see also D5 and D6. All right. Now, D, uh, P2, parity bit 2, that corresponds to this column. For S2, where, are, where do we have 1s for S2? Well, P2 itself, right here, is one of them, right? And then we have D1, exclusive ORD with D2 exclusive ORD with D3, and then we come down here, and also D7 is a member of that group. All right. And then the last parity bit, P3. What does it depend on? Well, P3, you got to get all the way down to the ninth row before you find P3, right? And the only other bits that are a member of the P3 group are D4, D5, D6, and D7. So we have the exclusive OR of D4, exclusive OR with D5, exclusive OR with D6, exclusive OR with D7. All right. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's just do a quick what if. What if D5 changed? D5, well, which groups is D5 a member of? Which parity groups is D5 a member of? Well, D5 is not a member of P0. So whenever we do the, the, the comparing of the stored P0 with the value of P0 that was calculated from the retrieved data, since D5 is not a member of P0, S0 is going to equal 0, all right? Now, D5 is a member of P1. So if D5 flips, the stored value of P1 is not going to match the calculated value of P1 after reading the data. So S1 is going to be a 1 because those two bits, the stored P P1 with the calculated P1 are going to be different. And so when we run those into an exclusive OR gate, we're going to get a 1. D5 is not a member of P2. So S2, the value of P2 stored is going to match the value of P2 calculated. So it's going to be a 0. Now, 
D5 is a member of P3, so S3 is going to equal a 1, indicating the fact that P3 stored doesn't match P3 calculated. And so the syndrome, the syndrome is going to be 1010. So we go down this table, 1010, we see that that's D5. It identifies it because D5 is the only one that is a member of, of the uh, P3 group and the P1 group. It's the only one, all right? Now, let's do one more quick, uh, quick observation, so to speak. I showed you that if I've got if I've got four parity bits, that gives me the ability to keep track of 11 data bits. Is there some way that we can figure out, in general, how many bits we can keep track of? Well, remember, what I did before was I said that if I've got n data bits and m parity bits, just in general, all right? Now, uh, in this case, this table that I made here, I had four parity bits and I had eight data bits, all right? Now, the question is that based on a certain number of parity bits, how many data bits can I, you know, keep track of? Well, I need to have one case in the syndrome where I have the all zeros case where there's no error. So, uh, so this is this is the, the we'll call these the the uh, the cases, right? We have one no error case. Okay. Now we also need to have m parity error cases. All right. So notice here in my table over here that what happened was I had four parity bits. So one, two, three, four rows were taken up with the parity errors. And then lastly, I need to have n data bit error cases. And so over here, I had the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then potentially 9, 10, 11 data bit errors. So there is a, there's a relationship between these things. And let me talk a little bit about what that relationship looks like. So, if I have m parity bits, that means I have m syndrome bits, right? That means that all of the cases, so 2 to the m has to be greater than or equal to all cases, right? All right. So, in other words, I had four uh, syndrome bits, I have four parity bits, that means I had 16 possible patterns of ones and zeros, that means I had to have, I'm limited to the number of cases I need to address, needs to be limited to 16. Now, what is the number of cases? Well, the total number of cases is just the addition of those three values. So I have two to the m has to be greater than or equal to one for the no error case, m for the parity bit error cases, and n for the data bit error cases. All right, so let's go ahead and substitute some numbers. We already figured out that two to the four, so when I have four parity bits, which is equal to 16, has to be greater than or equal to one plus four plus n. So what is n? That means n has to be limited to less than or equal to 16 minus 1 minus 4 or 11. And that's what we already determined with this table, right? When we had four bits, I had, I had areas for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 data bits. Now, what if we go a little higher? 2 to the fifth, if I have five parity bits, that's equal to 32, which is greater than or equal to one plus five plus n, which means n is going to be less than or equal to, n is limited by 32 minus one minus five, so it's gotta be less than or equal to 26, all right? Which means if I wanna store, if I wanna do a Hamming code for 16 data bits, 
all I need is five bits. All right. Now, six, what happens when we have two to the six? That equals 64, right? Which means it needs to be greater than or equal to one plus six plus n, which means n is limited by, well, 57, right? That's 64 minus uh, 7, which is 57. So I can, I can monitor six, 57 data bits using six syndrome bits. All right. Now let's go back two episodes ago, and we will talk a little bit about that global parity bit. Remember there was that additional bit, that global parity bit. What did the global parity bit do for us? Well, the global parity bit was the one that said that if there are two errors, we'll be able to tell after you fix the problem if maybe there were two errors and, and the data is, is not retrievable. It's corrupted for good. Um, so each one of these doesn't take into account that additional global parity bit. So whenever I say, if you want to do, remember we had single error correction, double error detection, single error correction, that's what this is taken care of. But if you want to add double error detection, you have to add one global parity bit. Which means that, for example, if I'm talking about using four data bits in order to protect 11, excuse me, four parity bits in order to protect 11 data bits, we need to have a fifth parity bit in order to make sure that we can also take care of double error detection. And that will give us the full complement of single error correction along with double error detection.